Good morning, everybody. I hope you're doing well today. Welcome to day three of Amplify. I must just say, I've been speaking with the KPMG guys and Bernard Sol earlier, and if anything, the next hour is going to be provocative, but it will certainly be entertaining, so get ready for a good laugh. Some formalities to start. My name is Ryan Gonsalves. I head up Innovation and Change here at AMP Bank, and I'm privileged to be your host here today at this Amplify session about the edge of demographic shift sponsored by KPMG. If, like me, this is your first Amplify, welcome. Uh, I guess you're still figuring out how great this actually is. Well, I'm certainly enjoying myself. I would also like to welcome the distinguished guests here to AMP, and it's good to see employees here in the room, but also through the live stream watching as well. So what we're going to do for this next hour, certainly I'm going to give us a little bit of an introduction. Uh, I'll then ask uh, Martin from KPMG to come and introduce Bernard Salt. When that's finished, we'll then have uh, time for Q&A. We're going to sit up here on the VIP seats, and this will give you a chance to ask yourself, ask a few questions to Bernard on what we've just gone through today. But before all that, because Amplify isn't just something for us to listen, it's for us to participate, we're going to do something a little bit different. So I hope you're all sitting comfortably. Uh, be prepared to be a little bit disturbed with what happens next. I'd like to invite Colin Boldra, who is director at KPMG's Performance Clinic, to the stage. Thanks. Cheers, Colin. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Colin Boldra. I'm very excited to be here. Um, and I'm going to take you through something that is not too different. In fact, all we're going to do is breathe. Um, I'll just get things sorted from a music perspective. So, in line with the previous presentation, KPMG Performance Clinic work with individuals to reduce their bio-age. We work to improve workplace performance. We give people back more time, energy and attention. So today, I'd like to position you in the right mind space to hear the fantastic presentation from Bernard. So, Let's all feel comfortable in our chair. Let's uncross our legs, put our feet on the ground. Relax your arms into a position where they're comfortable and start to breathe deeper. Put your hand on your belly if you feel that that's more comfortable for you so that you can actually feel the diaphragm moving the air in and out of your body. Deep breath, please. Push that belly all the way out and out. Now, diaphragmatic breathing helps us bring out the relaxation response, brings up the parasympathetic nervous system, allowing us to drift away from that fight or flight response. So, close your eyes and let's move into a more relaxed state, acknowledging the muscles that we've been using today, feeling into how we're sitting in the chair, grounding yourself, feeling gravity, pull all of the stresses that you've been experiencing today away, drifting your mind and your muscles down to the floor. Feeling your feet connect with the floor. Releasing all of the tension around your eyes, around the corners of your mouth, and breathing slowly and gently into a more relaxed state. Now, let's take your mind to a green grassy field, lying down, watching the deep blue sky and soft white clouds drift past your eyes. The cool breeze on this warm summer's day, bringing wafts 
the sea breeze not too far away. The feel of the grass around your skin as you lie there, totally relaxed. Feeling the breath in and out, taking you deeper into a state of total relaxation. Feeling every muscle in your body heavy. The warmth of the sun on your skin. The sound of birds in the background. As the slow breath that you take takes you on that relaxed journey, I want you to slowly start to acknowledge the health that you have and the value that you bring every day to your relationships and to your organisation. On the next out breath, I'd like you to start to bring yourself back into the room, acknowledging that everybody here is here to learn is here with an open mind and is here with open eyes. So, I don't need to ask how well that went. I can still see some nodding heads in the back. Um, so thank you very much. I hope that positions your mind in the right space to hear uh, my esteemed colleague, Bernard Salt. But let's also welcome back to the stage, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. That was brilliant. You make me feel guilty about having a coffee now. Um, well, look, uh, let's keep moving. Let's keep going through the session today. I'd like to now invite uh, Martin Blake. Now, Martin is chairman of New South Wales at KPMG and is also our lead partner here at AMP uh, from KPMG perspective. Really interesting uh, information about this chap is uh, avid sailor, wonderful sailor. Uh, hopefully, uh, you won't the same thing that happened to the New Zealand team and you won't capsize because you're falling asleep after that. But please come up and uh, let's keep going. Thanks. Thanks, Ryan. So uh, welcome everyone to today's session. Uh, we really want to do something a little bit different with uh, uh, Amplify in terms of on the edge and uh, I don't think we're going to disappoint uh, today. Um, we have Bernard Salt, uh, who's, uh, who will be known, I think, by many in the room as uh, a leading social commentator um, and also demographer, and is pretty much different from any other KPMG partner that you might find, certainly in Australia, as, as you will see. Um, uh, Bernard writes uh, two weekly columns in the Australian newspaper. In fact, I do get the Australian at the weekend just to read Bernard's column because it's always amusing. Uh, he's recently hosted uh, his own uh, TV show on Sky Business U News. He's an adjunct uh, professor at Curtin University Business School and uh, he had the honour of being awarded uh, a member of uh, Order of Australia in 2017. Um, and he's also published six books. Uh, he's perhaps best known in the broader community uh, for his penchant uh, for identifying uh, particular tribes and social behaviours. So he's uh, coined some, some phrases that may be familiar. The sea change uh, shift, uh, the man drought, uh, pumpkins, and the goat's cheese curtain that uh, you might find out a little bit more in his presentation. Um, Bernard today is going to share his uh, insights in terms of uh, demographic shifts impacting Australia uh, and of course uh, the famed um, smashed ar ar um, avocados which rocketed him to social media fame in 2016. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Bernard. Thank you. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, 
Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Martin, for that uh, introduction, and thank you also to uh, Amplify and AMP for the invitation to speak. Bernard Salt, I'm a partner with KPMG based in Melbourne. My presentation today uh, deals with um, big demographic shifts, not just in terms of demography, but I'm also interested in culture, in society, uh, and in the mind and mood of the Australian heartland. I think there is a heartland, and I think that it beats to a particular rhythm, and I actually think that it needs to change. And I want to come back to that in just a moment, but first I want to take you to the American heartland to provide a benchmark. Here are the 10 biggest businesses in America today. This is by market valuation uh, or capitalization. So you take the share price, multiply it by the number of, share, number of shares, and you get the value or theoretical value of a company. And if you look at this, uh, you can see uh, Apple and Google and Microsoft, Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon.com, Facebook, uh, Exxon Mobil, of course, JP Morgan, Johnson & Johnson, and the bank Wells Fargo. It is not the value of these companies that leaps off the screen and hits me between the eyes. It is the year in which these businesses were formed. Is it not a fact that half of the 10 biggest businesses in America today were formed in a single generation? Bill Gates, born in 1955, was 20 years old when Microsoft and then Apple were formed in the mid-1970s. Here is why the American economy and people are the most powerful economic and military force in history. It is writ large in this simple ranking of an economy, culture and people that can reinvent themselves in a single generation at a global level, in fact. This is world-class benchmarking, if you like. How does Australia compare by this measure? Uh, in fact, uh, we are innovative, we are entrepreneurial, uh, we are agile, the Prime Minister tells us so. How do, <laughs> how do we compare with world's best practice? Now, I get it that America is 13 times bigger than Australia, economically and demographically. Therefore, the figures on the right, when I put the top 10 businesses in Australia by US dollars market capitalisation, uh, are going to be 13 times smaller. But there should be something else that leaps off the screen and hits every Australian right between the eyes. And here it is. And you have BHP, the four banks, of course, uh, Telstra, CSL, West Farmers, Woolworths and the Macquarie Group. Just put the Macquarie Group to one side for a moment. Does this mean that the most recently created new big business on the Australian continent was formed in 1924? We are not innovative, we are not creative, we are not entrepreneurial. You could argue that we handed out franchises 100 years ago. Here's four banks, here's two retailers, here's a mining company, here's a telco, and we ain't moved on. By another measure, we are the third richest people on earth. Why would we be? We're rich enough. Why would be? The issue for the Australian people and Heartland, the great challenge, I think, is complacent prosperity. We have done well enough by this measure. In fact, the problem is there will be no more Fords and Toyotas and Alcoas and General Motors coming to Australia, employing Australians in their thousands on our terms. Those days are gone, 1950 to 2010. We need to create our own new big businesses of the future. What's our track record like? Why is it that the Americans can do that and the Australians do that? And I think it comes back to the heartland. The heartland of America admires entrepreneurship. It goes down to a thousand, a million, micro decisions made by people over 200 years, 400 years, to create that culture, the ecosystem, that cultivates a culture of creativity at a global scale. And I think that this is something that is a great challenge to the Australian people. You'd sort of expect the world's biggest mining company to come out of the Australian continent. We are the only people on earth to claim the resources of an entire continent. If we can't create the world's biggest mining company, then there's a problem. That should be our strategic strength. And you'd say, well, yep, it is. By the same logic, why is there not an agribusiness business in the top 10? That's our shtick, isn't it? We're really good at agribusiness. Why is there no West Farmers is not an agribusiness business. It's a coal exporter and a retailer, in fact. And you might think, oh, that's because agribusiness businesses don't get to be of that scale. 
What is the largest business by market capitalisation in New Zealand? It is Fonterra, which is a dairy company that plays at a global level. Fonterra was formed in about the year 2000 by an amalgamation of regional dairy boards to project New Zealand authority in this space globally with stunning success. The Australians would never let go of our parochialism, in fact, to see that bigger picture. In fact, we've now got uh, Bega Cheese and Murray Goulburn, but Warnable Cheese and Butter picked up by Saputo, in fact, the Canadians, in fact, snapped up by sovereign interests uh, elsewhere in the 1990s. We do not have the ability or have not demonstrated the ability to see the bigger picture. I am concerned that there is no agribusiness business there. I think we should, as a people, have as a national objective to actually create or put a globally significant agribusiness business in that top 10 by the end of the next decade or so. I think we should also have, as a people, this was actually summarised in my column in The Australian on the weekend, we should have as a national objective and priority the aspiration to have one of our universities ranked in the top 10. That is a great challenge for the Australian people because it means you've got to subjugate regional interests to say, that university will ingest, inject, uh, ingest um, resources into that university and going forward. To me, these are the, uh, the great challenges uh, for, uh, for Australia going forward. Before I get back to Australia fully, I want to take you to um, uh, globally to, uh, to this chart. I love this chart because it shows some of the largest cities on earth with numbers against them. Uh, those numbers show the proportion of the population in that city born overseas or abroad. That number for Sydney, Australia is 42%. 42% of 5 million people were born outside the Australian continent. Find me another city on earth where more than 42% of the population is born overseas. There's only two on the map. One is Dubai. These are guest workers. They do not have the same sovereign rights as migrants. And the other is Toronto. And they're all Americans just across the border. <laughs> High altitude, simple, clean, logical figures. You cannot make the case credibly that the Australian people are fundamentally racist if, racist incidents perhaps, if 42% of our largest city's population was born overseas. Go to New York, the Great Melting Pot, 29%. Go to Paris, 22%. Go to Berlin, 13%. Go to Tokyo, 2%. Go to Shanghai, 1%. The Germans get all angsty when Berlin gets to 13%. The Australians are at 42%. We're on a different planet. We are, must be, the most migrant-friendly, tolerant, absorbent people on Earth. And if not, who, where is? What other city? I thought Miami, in fact, uh, it's only 39%, or San Diego uh, in, in the high 30s as well. We're on a different planet, in fact. That must mean our consumer culture is continually changing. Out with tea, in with coffee, in with arugula, in with olive oil. Who knew what quinoa was five years ago? <laughs> who knew how to pronounce quinoa five years ago? It's an Arabic grain. We see cosmopolitanness as a measure of social sophistication. The Americans are impressed by nothing outside America. We are impressed by everything outside Australia. <laughs> it makes our consumer culture continually changing. You would argue that this place, these cities, must be the most challenging, dynamic consumer markets on earth. If you can make it here, you could make it pretty well anywhere because of the dynamism of the Australian market, uh, in fact. The other observation I have about this is where wealth is being created on the planet. In the 1990s, wealth was being created out of the Middle East. So you make your money in Saudi Arabia or Kuwait, but you park your money, your family, your lifestyle, you buy an apartment, you live three months of the year in a lifestyle city nearby called Dubai. That's why Dubai exists. It was a bolt hole in a troubled region. Russian billionaires do not live in Moscow. If you have a billion dollars to spend, are you really going to live in Moscow? <laughs> you will live in London, in Belgravia, and you'll, tell it, you'll commute. It's an hour's time difference away, two hours on a plane. This concept of transnational residencies. You make your money in one country, but you have a lifestyle bolt hole in another country. What is the greatest wealth generating region of our time and over the next decade? 
or that'd be China. Make your money in Shanghai, Guangzhou, Shenzhen. Park your money, your family, your lifestyle. Buy an apartment, live three months of the year. Educate your kids at a local university. Play golf, go to the casino, have a facelift. An overnight flight away, 8,000 kilometres. What are my choices? No, 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 no. Yes, yes, yes. As long as wealth is being generated here and they do not deliver lifestyle cities, and we do deliver lifestyle cities, money will flow from there to there for as long as the regulatory environment in China and Australia permits it. Russian billionaires are still in London 25 years later. This will continue for as long as it is permitted, in fact. That will have an extraordinary impact on Australian culture, consumer culture. We are an absorbent, tolerant people, in fact. You'll actually start to see an Asianisation of our values. Out with coffee, maybe back to tea. The great beverage shift uh, may take place in the, uh, the 2020s or so. These, of course, are the great tribes of Australia. Uh, you can't be in the business of uh, demographics and not have cool acronyms like yuppies and dinks. Here's some of the coolest acronyms uh, that we make up. Uh, <laughs> the first one are the pumpkins, P-U-M-C-I-N-S, and I suspect that everyone here is a bit of a pumpkin. Stands for the professional urban middle class in nice suburbs. <laughs> you can tell pumpkin men on a weekend they wear polo shirts, chinos and boat shoes. <laughs> and pumpkin women wear their active wear absolutely everywhere. <laughs> You can tell if you come from a pumpkin household if there's goat's cheese in the fridge. <laughs> I have this theory that households that eat goat's cheese do not eat McDonald's. They are mutually repellent. <laughs> Melbourne and Sydney in particular have what is known as a goat's cheese curtain. It's about five kilometres out from the CBD and rather inside or outside the goat's cheese curtain. <laughs> then you have uh, the nettles, the young power couple, 35 to 45, kids under the age of 15, both partners working household income of more than $150,000 per year. The nettle hotspot in Sydney is Paddington, Melbourne, Albert Park, and Sydney in Brisbane, it's New Farm. Nettle stands for not enough time to enjoy life. <laughs> and you can tell if you come from a nettle household if after the evening meal, you and your partner get out your iPhone and coordinate the next day's activities. And if you email that schedule to your nanny, then you're an uber nettle. I have in fact, <laughs> I have seen that done. My favourite, though, are the kippers. Uh, these are the young 20-somethings that live at home with their 50-something mum and dad. K-I-P-P-E-R-S. -P Kids in parents' pockets. Eroding retirement savings. <laughs> and then everyone loathes some Lombards. L-O-M-B-A-R-D-S. Lots of money, but a real dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take you back to China before coming back to Australia. I want to show you the 20 biggest cities in China ranging from Shanghai to whatever it is, Xiamen. Every one of them is as big as, if not bigger than Melbourne. You see Shanghai, 24 million people up from 14. What's that, 10 million people in 15 years? Gosh, that sounds like a lot. There are no cities in history that have ever added 10 million people in 15 years. In order to do that, you need food, energy resources, commodities. Who delivers food, energy resources, commodities? That'd be Australia. It is not our brilliance. We've been grabbed by the scruff of the neck and kicked forward. We're at the right time in history, dragged forward, in fact. I never like those consultants' reports that say, you know, the middle class of China's going from 200 million people to 400 million. What does that mean? There are no slums on the edge of Shanghai or Beijing. 10 million people being added to that. Everyone's got an apartment, everyone's got a mobile phone, everyone's got a plasma television. This is the great middle classification of China. You can see it writ large. Every one of these cities with an asterisk now has a direct air link into an Australian city, predominantly Sydney. In fact, uh, I love this one, number seven, Wuhan. I'd never heard of Wuhan. Uh, it's got eight million people in it. Three years ago, Wuhan opened a direct flight into Koolangatta. <laughs> that is not for the Gold Coasters to visit Wuhan. <laughs> That is, that, is, that is for the Wuhanese to have a holiday. Who can help them have a holiday? Food, energy resources, commodities, space, security, lifestyle, health, education, casino, gambling, golf, holidays. We're in the right place at the right time. Who would not want to be an Australian over the next 10, 15 years? But the heartland needs to create those businesses. 
instead of having an anti-business sentiment, a pro-business sentiment to deliver Commonwealth that delivers our quality of life. In the year in which Wuhan opened the direct air link to Kulangata, they also opened direct air links to Koh Samui, Phuket, Denpasar, Da Nang, Nha Trang and Rome. This is the great middle classification of China, in fact. Um, let's just take this one step further and look at um, uh, some big businesses. Uh, New York is uh, classically the, uh, the corporate head office globally of the world's biggest businesses. Uh, and in 2005, it had 22 of the Fortune 500 biggest businesses on earth by revenue. In fact, 10 years later, it was down to 17. Those businesses did not go out of business. They're still in New York. The threshold to make the 500, 500 biggest businesses actually lifted. I want to show you what has happened in Beijing in that time frame. These, of course, are state-owned enterprises. This is not market capitalisation. This is sheer revenue, in fact. The centre of gravity has shifted from London to, to New York to Beijing in our time zone. They need resources. They need commodities. They need lifestyle. They need health. They need education. They need holidays. That's us. That is our opportunity going forward. I want to show you one business in New York. Very impressed with this business. It's called Verizon. It's a telco. It's a bit like our Telstra. It's the old Bell Atlantic. It's headquartered in New York. And imagine if in 2005 you had have got onto the board of Verizon. And uh, 10 years later, you've gone from $72 billion in revenue to 132. You'd think it been pretty fantastic as a board member overseeing such extraordinary prosperity. How good is that? I want to show you the same revenue growth from the second biggest state-owned enterprise in China. It's a group called State Grid. It delivers electricity. Here is what's happened with State Grid. They also had $72 billion in turnover 10 years ago. The annual growth rate of its revenue is, what, 38% per year for 10 consecutive years. This is the business that delivers electricity to 1.3 billion people. Here is the middle classification of China writ large. In fact, it is that figure. And in fact, if you're a state grid, you think, well, why would we limit ourselves to China? Why wouldn't we pop up in Australia and buy that business? Bit of Gemini, bit of Ausgrid, which is what you would do. You would create a multinational business, state-owned enterprise, the way in which the Americans have with their global businesses. That, to me, is the, uh, is the future uh, going, uh, going forward. Um, in this chart, uh, I love this chart because it looks back over 60 years to look at GDP growth and contraction quarter by quarter from September 1959 through to December last year. Where you have two negative quarters together, you have a recession. Let's just read the last 60 years of economic and consumer history in Australia. This is when you were born, uh, or certainly developed your career. So if you just work, read it with me, you had growth, recession, growth, recession, growth, recession, growth, recession, growth, 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 25 years. The last time we put together 25 years of unbroken economic prosperity, 1860 to 1890. You are living in a one in a 100 year boom, time in history. In fact, imagine if you were in business trying to sell product to the Australians in the 1960s, as your parents were, your mum, your dad, probably your dad, in fact, in the 1960s. These people at that time remember the Great Depression. They fought in the Second World War. Don't get too uppity, don't get too ahead of yourself, don't trust credit, don't get into debt. You know these people because they're your parents, in fact. <laughs> whereas today, whereas today, every year is better than the last. Why wouldn't I max out my credit card? Why wouldn't I have total confidence in the future? In fact, 25 years, you would start to think about leveraging up a sense of entitlement, a sense of aspiration, not just inside the goat's cheese curtain, but everywhere. <laughs> Middle Australia starts to lift the bar in terms of how they expect to live. I reckon it'd be almost impossible to govern by the end of this time, because great sense of entitlement. Let's have a look at the way in which the average Australian lived back in the 1950s compared to today. 
Uh, and I want to take you first to suburbia. Here's a quarter acre block. It's a thousand square metres and a three bedroom brick veneer. Mum and dad, four kids. Dad works. Mum's a housewife. Two kids, bunk beds per bedroom. Come with me into the house of the 1950s. Your parents' house, maybe your grandparents' house. You come up the pathway onto the porch. It was called a porch. And you turned right into the lounge room, which was then a modern incarnation of the parlour. The parlour was the good room. There was only one good room back in the 1950s. The good room was where you entertained guests and suitors. Suitors never got near a bedroom in the 1950s. <laughs> very, very different today. Off to, off, to the side, off to the side would be a mahogany side stand with a silver tea service. The purpose was to showcase the wealth, the prosperity, the social status of the household running that, uh, running that, uh, that house, in fact. Come with me now into the house of today in middle Australia after 25 years of unbroken economic prosperity. Here's how we live. It's not 1,000 square metres, it's only 500 square metres. But it is four bedrooms, not three bedrooms. It's two bathrooms, not one bathroom. It's two income earners, not one income earner. And it's two kids, not four kids. Come with me into the house of today. You come down the pathway onto the entry. In a different configuration, you would have a central hallway with bedrooms off to the side. Guests are not entertained in an English parlour, but they're entertained in the belly of the house. It means you must come down the central hallway past the open doors to the bedrooms. What that means is that the bedrooms now must be glimpse perfect. And as a consequence, we've had the pillowfication of the bedroom <laughs> <coughs> over the last decade or so. Not two pillows, not four pillows, but six pillows. A thing that I now know is called a bolster and a thing at the other end of the bed that's called a throw. The purpose of the pillowfication is to showcase the wealth, the prosperity, but importantly, the social harmony of the couple that run this household. Both partners work, they've got enough time in the morning to fluff up the pillows exactly right. <laughs> And men can never get the pillow architecture right. <laughs> you hold the pillows up by the ears, you fluff it up and you drop it into position and then you karate chop in the middle, get that perfect V. This is as important to showcasing our values as was the silver tea service back in the 1950s. Then guests are brought into the belly of the house and you mill around an island bench which means the island bench has had to move up market. It's now marble, Calicutta marble in waterfall style. And rising out of the centre of it will be a silver grogne gooseneck tap. <laughs> Tapware is now the new silverware, in fact. And then hosts will stand around in front of minimalist cupboards with soft closing drawers with a Danish closing mechanism. It matters to the Australians Italian marble, German tapware, Danish closing mechanisms. We are impressed by cosmopolitan influences on our changeable migrant culture, the most dynamic migrant culture on earth. What are the businesses that have emerged in middle Australia that have actually delivered the wherewithal to deliver this way of living, in fact? Off to the side is what we used to call a back veranda, then we called it a deck. Today we call it El Fresco. <laughs> which is a Mediterranean term. I reckon the Greeks, the Italians, arrived here in the 1950s and went, what the hell are you Australians doing living in an English house? You have a Mediterranean climate. You should have indoor, outdoor. Actually, you're right. It took us 30 years. And we started to shift our palate, our culture, our beverage. We even started to kiss each other on the cheek as a measure of sophistication. Our palate, our beverages, our housing, even our dress sense changed. Have we reached peak house? I'd say no. Uh, what are the influences in the future? Asian, Indian, Arabic influences. How will Australia change? What are the business opportunities that will present itself in middle and outer suburbia, regional Australia going forward? Next chart, I want to look at uh, life expectancy in Australia. In uh, 80 years ago, 1937, life expectancy for the average Aussie was 63 years. You qualified for the age pension at 65, so you dropped dead before you got a pension back in 1937. 
there were no teenagers. You're a child for 14 years, then you're an adult, and you died at work, basically. <laughs> at 50, you're an old person at 50. Uh, and in fact, if you were 50 years old and unhappy in your relationship in 1937, you'd think, well, you know, what's the point? I'm going to be dead in 10 years' time. I might as well just wait this out. Whereas baby boomers think, I've got another 30 years of life. I think differently about being 50 if I've got another 30 years of life. 40 years later, life expectancy is now 71, six years in retirement. The concept of the teenager makes their appearance, and you're now not old until into your 60s. 40 years later, life expectancy is now, in fact, 82. That is 17 years in retirement. Although the most common age of retirement for an Australian is not 65, it's 58. That is 24 years in retirement. What are you going to do? Sit at home and babysit the grandkids for 24 years? <laughs> Baby boomers will reinvent that space between 58 and 72. And they'll want products, services, marketing, management, financial services management, going for downshifting, downsizing. Uh, hips and knees replacements would be a business to be in. Um, a concept of reward me now. I've worked for 40 years as a school teacher or a nurse. I've got my superannuation payout. I've raised my kids. I've paid my taxes. I've raised a family. It's my time now. Reward me now. I want a Ryan River cruise. I want an Alaskan cruise, in fact. One of the, um, I spoke about a year ago to a kitchen renovation company. They said their business is absolutely booming with baby boomers not downshifting or downsizing, but remaining in situ and making over their kitchen. So it's a 1970s kitchen with the waterfall top, you know, the, the tap and whatever. Uh, they are nesting. Nesting and reward me would be the opportunities in business going forward. And then, of course, younger people uh, delaying commitment to marriage, mortgage, children and career until uh, 30 or so, or early 30s, in fact. Uh, this raises the issue of the different uh, generations, starting with the baby boomers, born 1946 to 1964. There's about five million of them, deeply hierarchical. Uh, measured their success as parents by how much they could give their kids, in fact. You could argue that it was indulgence, because they were raised themselves by Depression-era parents. That was a measure of success. The sandwich generation, because they are dealing with their kipper kids and their 80 and 90-something parents, in fact. Then you have uh, Generation X, today's 30-somethings and 40-somethings, always in the wrong place at the wrong time. <laughs> baby boomers got thief. I, I regard them as the pissed-off generation. They, they're sick of baby boomers. They're sick of Generation Y. What about me? Baby boomers got fee-free tertiary education, 1972 to 1987. Xs went into the workforce, early 1990s. Unemployment peaked at 12%, in fact. Then they went into the workforce working to baby boomer management for 10 years before they got their hands on the top job. Just after the year 2000, just into the workforce came young Generation Y, and it was all about Generation Y. Um, are we paying you enough Generation Y? Is anyone being mean to you, Generation Y? Can I get you a pillow, Generation Y? Bugger Generation, what about me? Exes, pissed off Generation. Then you have Generation Y, or the Millennials, um, this is the special generation raised in a period of unfettered prosperity by uh, parents, one or two kids in a family, always used to dealing with an adult. You know, if you're one of six kids, you wait your turn. If you're one of one kid or two kids, you're dealing directly with authority, in fact. Being told you're special from the age of five by parents, teachers, employers, which is all well and good, but what happens when you wake up at the age of 35, you're married with a mortgage and kids, you look straight down the barrel towards middle age, you wake up one day and you realise, I'm not special, I'm not famous, I'm not a celebrity, I've been lied to all my life. It'll all be someone else's fault, of course. Uh, very, very entrepreneurial, very entrepreneurial generation. Uh, in fact, how can we harness that entrepreneurial spirit uh, for, the, uh, for the good of the country? And then finally, Generation Z, these are the children of Generation X women, the second generation of women who went back to work. They carry no guilt about this. Uh, look, kid, I work, get over it. You're not special, that's the way it is. <laughs> you could argue that the wise of the Peter Pan generation just raised to adulthood in an era of unfettered prosperity. The dreamers, the entrepreneurs that we need to harness to create the businesses of the future. And the Zeds raised to adulthood in a post-GFC world, 
rising taxation, rising unemployment, rising uncertainty. The pragmatists, if you like, the 2020s, that will clean it all up. A uh, more conservative generation, perhaps, uh, going forward. This leads me to uh, the um, um, Martin called famous, and maybe infamous column, in fact, that I wrote in October last year uh, around smashed avocados. And it was written as a parody of baby boomers going into a hipster cafe. Uh, and um, so it was a satire of baby boomers and uh, loosely autobiographical. It made the point that when you're a baby boomer going into a hipster cafe, you can't read the menu because the writing is too small. You can't hear yourself speak because the music is too loud. And you can't sit on milk crates because it means your bottom is lower than your knees and you can't get back up again. And then you secretly whisper to each other, look at all these young people eating smashed avocados, shouldn't they be saving for a house? <laughs> of course, Twitter, Twitter took just that comment, Bernard Salt said this, what do you reckon? It went live at 6.27 on Monday morning. Uh, by 10am, I was fielding calls from the BBC in London. <laughs> This went global instantly. In fact, it made page three of the Stuttgart German newspaper. <laughs> it made the newspapers in Caracas, Venezuela. Uh, and in fact, I particularly liked the social media around it. Uh, I stopped eating smashed avocado, and now I own a castle. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Tim Gurner's comments from about three weeks ago has taken this the New York Times is right across America. Um, I I've been getting, any time anyone eats smashed avocado anywhere on the planet, <laughs> they take a photograph of it and tag me into it <laughs> every, every day. I have seen smashed avocados from Kiev in the Ukraine. <laughs> so, anyway, um, here, is, uh, here is where wealth is being created in Australia in the 21st century. There are some things that you can say uh, as a fact. In between February 2000 and February 2017, the Australian economy added 3.6 million jobs. Full-time, part-time, good jobs, bad jobs. I'm interested in high altitude, broad brush demographics. But we lost 296,000 jobs. So Alcoa closes in Geelong, that's 1,000 jobs. Queensland Nickel closes in Townsville, that's 250 jobs. But does that mean that for every job we have lost, we've created, I don't know, 13 others? That would seem to me to be a pretty good ratio. I wonder where those 13 jobs are, because I would gear my entire business around the happy space, where people are being employed, industry is expanding, and that would be up here. 700,000 out of 3.2 million, let's say about one job in four, in the 21st century on the Australian continent has been in healthcare and social assistance. And the oldest baby boomer is what, 68, 69? Is this a space to be in? And then professional services, construction, education, public administration, never look at the numbers. The numbers are boring in demographics. What is the common denominator that links the five rockets, if you like, on the left-hand side of this chart? Because I would say, in order to participate in the prosperity of modern Australia, you need either a university degree or technical training. These are all knowledge workers, in fact. Which cities on the Australian continent deliver most knowledge worker jobs? That'd be Melbourne and Sydney. Which cities on the Australian continent are proving to be impervious to the collapse of the mining boom? That'd be Melbourne and Sydney. A structural shift in the economy. Where do you not want to be? Well, manufacturing through globalisation, that's been outsourced to Guangzhou. And then agriculture, well, we're producing more agricultural product than ever before, but we don't need the labour out in the region. It's mechanisation, in fact. But apart from that, this is unskilled, low-skilled work. This is skilled work. These are the have-nots. These are the haves. This is a schism open air in society. Big business, big banks, big this, big that. How come you bastards are so rich? This is something that actually drives Australian apart. I don't want to live in a place like that. I want to live in Australia where everyone believes they have a shot at prosperity. How can we galvanise the nation into one? And this idea of um, uh, supporting big business, not seeing it as an enemy or not seeing business as an enemy, 
but as a key mechanism to driving prosperity and to building a commonwealth that we all share in. These are the big ideals that doesn't come down to what's the government going to do about it? Because I would say, what is each and every Australian going to do about it? By saying what's the government's going to do about it, you're outsourcing the product. I've identified the product, the government needs to do that. Until they do that, it's off my hands. But if I say, no, what are you as an individual going to do? I am going to shift the way I view entrepreneurs. I am going to become involved in volunteering, in community service work, in making a contribution, in building a better society. That shifts the responsibility to 24 million people instead of focusing it on, on politicians, which then excuses the rest of the country from actually making a contribution. We need to shift the thinking of the heartland, is my point. And then finally, uh, some um, key figures. Um, the, uh, 28th of June is a very important day. What is that, about uh, three weeks away? Because we get the 2016 census results and I can update these figures. Um, if you look at jobs like photographic film developer, you have to explain to a generation why what actually this was. <laughs> Prior to digital cameras, you actually took a film to a chemist, they'd send it away, 5,000 people or so would actually develop that film, they'd send it back to the chemist and you'd get your uh, film back. Uh, that was halved within 10 years, in fact. Uh, and I reckon by 2016, that job will have evaporated from the Australian continent, in fact. Truck driver is actually one of the 10 most popular jobs on the Australian continent. The number one job is general clerks, about 400,000 of them. Uh, number 10, I don't think it's about eight or nine or 10, is truck driver, 135,000. Um, I reckon that will still grow in 2016, uh, but with driverless vehicles, which I expect to come into commercial vehicles first, uh, by 2026, you might see that starting to decline, in fact. And then sewing machinists, uh, in fact, uh, you know, all the factories in maybe Collingwood uh, or Marrickville, um, all those businesses now in Guangzhou, 11,000, that might be down to, say, five or 6,000. That's my bet uh, for the 2016 census, in fact. The areas of growth, in fact, aged or disabled carer was the fastest growing job on the Australian continent between the 20, 2006 and 2011 census. In fact, it's up 50 odd thousand in 10 years. What's that? 5,000 jobs per year. This is a space to actually be in, and I expect that to be maybe 130 odd thousand uh, by. Um, um, interestingly, the, even the concept of barista was not acknowledged by the census boffins. <laughs> they didn't know what a barista was in 2001. By 2006, they suddenly realised there's a job called barista. Uh, and 8,000 just materialise out of nowhere. <laughs> Five years later, there's another 15,000 to 22,000. Wouldn't surprise me to see uh, somewhere in the 40s uh, later this, uh, this month. And checkout operator, um, 80,000 to 106,000. So it's about, uh, it ranks about 13th or 14th most popular job in Australia. I think that will continue to rise. But ultimately, through digitisation, automation, Amazonification, in fact, I would see that subside in the future as well. And then just finally, some, uh, some key points around um, ageing. Here is the number of people added to the Australian continent over 100 years. It's 1950 through to 2050, and these figures go up to 2005. It's the number of people added every year to the Australian continent aged 65 and over. Do we not agree that over the last 60 odd years, the number of people added to the continent over 65, it's about 40,000 people per year. So we have to grow our economy by a sufficient amount to accommodate another 40,000 people who say, thank you very much, you'll have an age pension. Thank you very much, you'll have superannuate or uh, pharmaceutical benefits, whatever else is going. Here is the next 45 years from 2005. And of course, this is the baby boomer. It didn't matter when the baby boomers turned 20, 30, 40, 50 or 60, they're still in the workforce, still paying tax. It matters when they turn 65 because they go from a demographic dividend to Australia to a demographic liability to Australia. And it ain't going to change for 30 years. If you are 28 years old, this is going to define your career. There is no escaping it. And you can't go to America, because it's the same there. You can't go to Japan, it's the same there. France or Germany, it's exactly the same. 
uh, the argument here is that um, this is going to shift the way we think. It's great challenges for Australia and, uh, and beyond. And then just finally, some, uh, some key points. Uh, we are the only nation to claim the resources of an entire continent. We do so with barely 25 million people, 24 million people. We should be a rich and prosperous people for 100 years, purely on this equation. We need the governance right, we need security, we need the heartland to think creatively and have the capacity to build the businesses, small, medium and large. And you can't do that if you have a negative sentiment from the heartland about, uh, about business, in fact. Um, the consumer market is changing continually, and I would argue we're the most, most dynamic consumer markets on earth, largely because of the migration uh, effect uh, and the knowledge economy uh, transforming the way we work, uh, creating, uh, hopefully, a better society. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Bernard, thanks. Please take a seat here. Bernard, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, as promised, that was um, <laughs> entertaining. Thank you. Uh, enthralling as well, actually. And there's actually some information I took away when I wasn't <laughs> laughing, so that was brilliant. Um, okay, we're going to have time for just a couple of, uh, maybe one question. So if I can turn to the audience, who would, uh, who would like to ask a question? I think every... Uh, oh, we have a, a question at, at the back there. Please wait for the microphone. Oh, right. Let us know yeah. who you are. Uh, Michael Schreck, I'm the American, so I want to ask <laughs> a question on this. You began with a word that was really, really interesting, and it sort of went away, which was <laughs> complacent wealth. Yeah. What do you think the country or the government or the educational system needs to do, because I read your column as well, to, to shift that sense of complacency? You gave all of the data, but complacency is a cultural value. What's the cultural shift you want to see? The cultural shift I want to see, I think complacent prosperity is, uh, in many respects, our uh, greatest asset. It de delivers our quality of life, extraordinary quality of life. Uh, I could also say complacent security. We have, from 1942, presumed the support of the American military, in fact. Complacent prosperity and complacent security assumptions are the greatest threats to Australia going forward, in fact. We need to be realistic and honest about the way or our position in the world and uh, where our pressure points are. But complacent prosperity means that we have benefited extraordinarily uh, from, uh, from uh, the, the wealth of the Australian continent. I've often argued that uh, we should have on the, um, on the $5 note, for those of you who still use cash, uh, a photograph of Port Hedland as the greatest tax contributor to the Australian people. Um, so it's that easy wealth, easy prosperity, um, easy security that has created a culture that we think we're entrepreneurial, but when you stand against world's best practice, and you know may, the Americans are pretty good at this, um, the picture is quite confronting, in fact. Now, each one of those businesses are very uh, innovative in their own way, but you have to ask yourself, why is it that we were not able to or would not do what the New Zealanders did with Fonterra? A vast country, we are damned by parochialism, in fact. The East doesn't want to merge with the West, whereas in New Zealand, it's only five million people fused together. They could overcome that, uh, that, um, the, the state-based division of the country. So I would like to, I actually think that we should be uh, thinking strategically, thinking beyond the next five years, thinking to the 2030s or so, thinking about how to create wealth and realising this is not an issue that the government is going to fix. It's going to be addressed if every Australian shifts their attitude towards business at all levels. And my column on the weekend, I think especially big business. We are an extraordinarily large continent. You cannot deliver and develop the resources of the Australian continent with a series of milk bars. You need big gutsy businesses to invest tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars to leverage the wealth and resources of the Australian continent. And if we can't do that, 
then we will start to cede sovereignty of this continent and its mechanisms of wealth to other nations. Bernard, absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much. You've okay. really brought uh, demographics to life today. Thank you, Bernard. Thank you very much. Thank you.